the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who has set me to be judge and arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool this very night. Your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Our text this morning poses three questions. Yet these three questions, like so much of the Bible, lead to so many more questions. First, Jesus asks the man in the crowd, Friend, who put me in charge as judge or divider over you? Secondly, the rich landowner asks himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Third, God asks the rich landowner, To whom will the things which you saved belong? All of these questions revolve around one central question. What does it mean to live richly toward God? In other words, what's the difference between life apart from God and life apart of God? The rich landowner in our text, you'll notice he's functioning out of fear. The parable, it's a reference back to Exodus 16 and God promising to provide manna in the wilderness. Do you all remember manna from Sunday school? It came every morning and the Israelites were to only collect that which was needed for their community for that day, trusting God would provide again tomorrow. Do we really trust God like that? Would we be willing to collect that which we need for the day and trust that tomorrow God will again provide? The landowner of our text fears death. He fears not being able to eat. He fears not being content and being unable to care for himself. Maybe he fears that nobody will care for him if he doesn't plan and prepare for himself. And it's possible his fears that they have foundation in reality. We often don't do well at providing for the needs of all people. But let's be careful to not distance ourselves too far from the rich landowner. So we must ask ourselves, what do we fear? Do you fear the same things as the rich landowner? Do you fear death? I do. Do you fear for your safety, your security? Again, sometimes I do. What do your neighbors fear? What are some of the fears of this community? Do you know? Have you asked them? See, we often don't want to talk about our fears. We often avoid them. In a sense, this is what the rich landowner is doing. His fear has caused him to plan, but he planned without God. He planned without his community at heart. He focused on himself and his own well-being. Now, the rich man isn't a fool because he saved his surplus. The rich man is a fool because he thought his soul, the very breath of God living within him, would be satisfied by that surplus. He thought he'd be satisfied with a life apart from God. But that life won't ever satisfy our soul. Only a life apart of God will do that. And the result of a life lived apart of God is that we live a life 
in the richness of community. We live as one sacred community. We see how the rich landowner's fears influenced his actions, but how does fear influence our actions? How does fear influence the actions of our neighbor? How is fear influencing the actions of our Hispanic and Latino siblings in Christ? I can tell you some of what's being communicated by that community. There's a fear of gathering. There's a fear of worshiping together. There's a fear of being targeted, detained, harassed. Can you imagine being so concerned for your safety that you don't feel as though you could come here to grace? Can you imagine what it would be like to be so fearful that you wouldn't come to this place and worship? Our fears, when they motivate our actions, they cause us to live apart. They cause us to withdraw from each other and our communities. They cause us to live in a manner that God does not intend. This doesn't mean that fear is unrealistic or unreal or imaginary. Fear of detainment is a very real and realistic fear for our Hispanic and Latino community. Yeah, how do we engage each other amidst these very real fears that we have? How do we live a part of God and not a part from God? This text doesn't mean that if you behave or have enough faith, if you follow God or are worthy enough, that God will give you wealth. It means that if in your life you accumulate wealth, whatever wealth is, whether it's financial or spiritual, it's healing or peace or time, whatever it is, you recognize that it's not yours alone, that you live richly toward God by freely sharing with those in need, knowing that you cannot secure your own future. You can't save enough, you can't invest enough, you can't manage your endowments or retirements well enough to guarantee yourself life. But you can ease the suffering of others with your wealth here and now. You can live richly toward God and toward God's beloved creation. You see, Luke is writing about salvation. Luke sees salvation as something that happens both here in the present and also something in the future. Luke writes of an opportunity for salvation in the present when we live unselfishly and richly toward God. One, one commentary writes that the salvation embraces the present, restoring the integrity of human life, revitalizing human communities, setting the cosmos in order, and commissioning the community of God's people to put God's grace into practice among themselves and toward an ever-widening circle of others. Luke's understanding of salvation doesn't separate parts of personhood. He doesn't separate the social from the spiritual, the emotional from the economic, the relational from the cultural parts of us. Instead, Luke embraces the totality of embodied life. He embraces all of us, every part of us. And it's in the midst of this fullness of personhood that we find Jesus and are inspired to new ways of living in the world. Pastor Jody likes to say, and here's the good news. Luke doesn't sugarcoat the good news. This good news is both good and difficult. It's both liberating and challenging because we've been both called to and at the same time called to respond. We're called to Christ. We're called God's own. We're called to by the Spirit. And at the same time called through actions and deeds. Jesus called his disciples and they moved, they acted. You see, we've been, we have been freed for, not simply freed from. This means that we've been freed to live a part of God. As difficult as it may be, to live as one sacred community. We've been called to live richly toward God, which means we've been both called and at the same time freed to live richly towards those in our community, especially those who suffer and are different from us. Because what we do for, with, and to the least of these, we do to Jesus. 
Today I'm going to leave you with a question to ponder. How can we live richly toward both neighbor and stranger here in Fremont, Ohio? I'll give you a hint. It begins by seeking out and listening to those in our sacred community who are living in fear, wherever they may be. Amen.